Good evening, church family. This is Pastor McInerney from Bible Baptist Church, Savannah, uh, joining you this evening on Wednesday, November 4th. It is the day after our national election, and while there is still uncertainty in our nation, uh, we have full certainty in our Lord and in His Word. And so we're glad that you've joined us tonight for our midweek Bible study. As we announced last Sunday, where we had taken a, a pause uh, because of some uh, COVID cases and making sure that everyone is well before we return. And after reviewing some of that and with the, the uh, COVID cases have a tendency to ripple. And so having some of that effect, we have decided to uh, postpone our regathering here until one week from tonight. Uh, Wednesday, November 11th is our new on-site goal. And uh, so you may have already received the pastor's page. If you do not get our pastor's page email. You may have missed that, but there will be no services again this Sunday. Uh, that will give us a full two weeks of Sundays uh, to be off campus before we get back together. And so I'll share more of that information in our online messages this Sunday. But just as a reminder, uh, we will be gathering back here on campus one week from tonight. Wednesday, November 11th is our goal. Uh, we are glad that you're joining us tonight and uh, we are... Uh, uh, listening to the uh, uh, news and things that are happening around our world. And, and certainly the Bible says in everything, give thanks. And so uh, while we're still not certain about the election and the president and Georgia and all these things, uh, we want to be thankful for our nation, pray for our nation, uh, pray for our leaders and pray for God's will to be done, as we said, on earth as it is in heaven. And so in just a moment, we're going to have a couple songs and then Pastor Paul Long is going to be bringing our midweek Bible study. We're going to take the life group lesson that would have been taught on last Sunday, November 1st, and so that all of our groups can stay uh, on track. He's going to be bringing that as our midweek Bible study uh, in just a few moments. So enjoy these songs uh, of worship and praise, and then get your Bibles ready uh, for this midweek Bible study, and we'll see you again on Sunday.
Looking forward to, uh, thank you for allowing me to be here tonight, looking forward to presenting this lesson. We are, of course, going to be doing lesson nine, and that is in Matthew chapter six, Matthew chapter six. Uh, the lesson today focuses on true worship and service and the uh, matters of the heart. Uh, we're going to be looking today, uh, Jesus will be discussing why we do what we do, uh, not only what we're doing, but why we do it, the motivation, the attitude behind what we do. So, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse number 1, I'm going to read through all 18 verses, and then we're going to come back and discuss them. Matthew 6, verse number 1 says this, Take heed that ye do not your alms before men to be seen of them, otherwise ye have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, 
that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But when thou doest alms, let not thy right left hand know what thy right hand doeth. That thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret himself shall reward thee openly. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before you ask him. After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Verse 16. Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly." Now, we're going to be talking about several areas in the Christian life, in the believer's life, uh, specifically in regards to alms, which we do not use that word very much anymore, but it is a reference to uh, righteous acts or charitable deeds. So Christ is going to be talking in these 18 verses about alms or charitable deeds. He's going to be talking about prayer, and he's going to be talking about probably one of the least disciplines that uh, Christians in America practice, and that is fasting. If you're like me, I fast from supper till breakfast, from breakfast to lunch, and from lunch to supper. That that is generally the extent of my fast. I do fast occasionally, but it is certainly a discipline that we as Christians do not practice as often as we should. And as we're looking at these disciplines, uh, alms, prayer, and fasting, we're going to see how Christ addresses what the religious leaders of, their, of his day believed that involved, and then his interpretation of what it should be like. Okay? So, <coughs> let's look at chapter uh, 6, verse 1. We're going to be looking at the first four v- verses and talking about the proper attitude towards alms or charitable deeds. It says, now my question to you, though, before we get into discussing the alms, the prayers, and the uh, fasting is this. Why does it matter what our motivation or attitude is uh, in these three uh, areas? Why, why does our motivation have to be right? And, and I want to make sure we get this correct because this really is the bottom line. Why does it matter what our motivation is? You know, uh, doesn't the end justify the means? Well, no, absolutely not. And we see in these verses, uh, Jesus discusses why motivation or attitude is the most important part of uh, doing these three in these three areas. So, but let me give you three reasons why motivation or attitude is, is important. Number one, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Our motivation in everything that we do should be for God's glory. That should be first. That should be primary. Secondly, to win the lost. To win the lost. Our actions should be an example to uh, unbelievers to point them to Christ. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. 
to them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Here's the key to me in verse 22. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. So our actions should point others to Christ. And finally, finally, one day we will give an account for everything we have done as a believer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to, the, to that he hath done, whether it be good or, get, or bad. You see, one day every Christian will stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ. It won't be for salvation, but it will be for our works. And those works will be judged. And what will they be judged on? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 19, it says this. Oh, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 3. Sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 10 talks about the wood, the hay, and the stubble, the gold, the silver, and precious stones. Look here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse number 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. For Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, for every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. So it's important to understand that for believers, everything we do shall be judged. And that's another reason why our motivation, because what will it be judged for? It will be judged on why we did what we did, for the motivation behind what we did. Did we do it to honor God? Did we do it to glorify God? Or did we do it for our own self, for our own praise, or to make us look good in other people's eyes? So that's the, that's the three reasons for our proper attitude. But now let's actually get into uh, the proper attitude towards alms. In, in chapter 6, verse number 1, it says this, "...take heed that ye do not your alms before men." In other words, pay attention to why you're doing what you're doing. If it's to be seen of them, otherwise you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Everything that we do <coughs> will be rewarded. Excuse me. Everything we will do will be rewarded. We will either be rewarded here on earth or we will be rewarded in heaven. And I know most believers, as a believer, what do we want to hear? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, we want to be rewarded in heaven. But what determines that reward is the motivation or the attitude behind what we do. He says, therefore, when. Notice he uses the word when, not if. God expects believers to, to work, to perform acts of service on his behalf. He says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Verse 2, Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. These men, these men that were praying in public, they would sound a trumpet before they would begin to pray so that people would pay attention to them. And they were doing it for to, 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 to act pious in front of these people. They would sound the trumpet and they would stand up and they would pray out loud and pray these long prayers. And they would do so for, to, try and to and try and show themselves as being self-righteous or pious. And what does Jesus say about these people? They have the wrong motivation. They have the wrong attitude. Their attitude is to be praised to men. And he says, he says here in, in the verse 2, they have their reward. Now, they're going to have the reward of being praised before men, but they're not going to have the reward of being praised before God. And that should be our desire. That should be our desire. It says, The ostentatious, ostentatious show of giving to impress others with their wealth and generosity, it says, may impress others, but it means nothing to God. Nothing to God. 
Since they wanted to receive the praise of men, they would receive no reward at all from God. Even believers today may feel pleased when others admire them and approve their deeds. The question we must ask ourselves is, what motivates us to do these deeds? Why do we do what we do? That, that gets to the heart of the matter. Let me ask you this, in, in regards to, to tithing, do you give because it's a tax deduction? Or do you give because you want to be obedient to God? Do you want to be a blessing to others? That's getting to the, the motivation of it. All right, so what guidelines should we use <coughs> excuse me, in giving to the Lord? Well, in 1 Corinthians 16, it gives us some guidelines. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse number 1. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. Verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store, as God hath prospered them, him that there be no gatherings when I come. Now notice in these verses, specifically in verse 2, it talks about how we are to give. One, it is to be periodic, upon the first day of the week. It should be regular, it should be consistent, periodic. Number two, it is personal. Let every one of you lay by him in store. Each of us individually are to give. And then three, it is to be proportionate. It is to be proportionate. Uh, latter part of our middle part of verse two, it says, as God hath prospered him. So when we give, it is to be periodic, it is to be personal, and it is to be proportionate. <coughs> so that's the, that in verses one and two indicate the wrong way of giving. Verses 3 and 4 indicate the right way of giving, the right way of giving. Let's look at verse 3. It says, but when, there's that word when again, it's expected of believers to give. When thou doest alms, let not thy right hand know, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Here again, whose reward do you want? Do you want the reward of the world or, as in verses 3 and 4, the right way, do you want the reward of the Father? The reward of the Father. What does he say to do? Let not thy left hand know what thy right hand is doing. In other words, it should be, it sh it should be uh, spontaneous. It should be generous. It should be liberal. It should be cheerful. The Bible says God lo loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. Now, now, giving is, is serious, yes. It is not to be flippant. But I do believe that we are to give liberally and we are to give cheerfully. It should be a joy to be able to give. God has given us the ability, the help, the ability to work. Uh, he has given us all of that. And so to be able to give should be a joy and a privilege. It should not be something that we look on as just another bill to pay, as, as something if I don't do it, God's going to judge me. No, we have, the, we have the privilege, the responsibility of giving to the Lord's work, giving to other people, and we should not take that lightly. Um, <coughs> so, in regards to the proper attitudes towards alms, there is the wrong way, which is giving to impress others, and there is a right way. Notice what he says, uh, that thine alms may be in secret. We should not be publicizing how much we're giving. That should be between you and the Lord, whether it be in tithing or in you know, giving to help others in other ways. That should not be done publicly. If someone does that publicly, desires to be recognized publicly, to me, that is an indication that they are doing it for the wrong reasons, for the wrong reasons. Now, let's look at the proper attitude towards prayer in verses 5 through 15. <coughs> Excuse me. The proper attitude towards prayer in verses 5 through 15. Let's start by looking at the wrong way. Verse 5. And when, again, he uses the word when, not if, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites or pretenders are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen, seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Notice, they have an earthly reward. They're seen of men. That's what they want. That's how they want to be rewarded. But that's the wrong way, according to Christ. Verse 6, 
but when thou prayest, okay, but when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. Enter into thy closet. This is the right way, verse 6. This is the right way. Enter into thy closet or thy inner room, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. When we pray, it is to be personal. It is to be between, between me and my Savior, between me and my Lord. I don't need to stand out in public. And there's nothing wrong with public prayer. We have it here in church during service. But we should not be praying for the praise of men. Our, pray, our prayer needs to be in secret. And then what does it say will be our reward? Our Father which seeth in secret, he's going to reward thee openly. He's going to reward these, thee openly. These are the, the, uh, this is the right way. This is the right way. <coughs> Excuse me. Prayer is not man's attempt to change the will of God. Prayer is not, is not conquering God's reluctance to answer, but laying hold of his willingness to help. Think about that. As a father, as a parent, we love to give to our children, don't we? We, we don't want to be reluctant when we give to our children unless they're being disobedient. You know, then we may withhold blessings from them. But as a heavenly father who, or, or as an earthly father who loves his children, we want to give to our children. And God wants to give to us. We need to understand that. We are not trying to pry these blessings from God. He wants to give to us. But we must come to him the right way and with the right attitude or motivation. So in verses... Uh, 7 and 8, it says, But when you pray, use not vain repetition. This is the instructions. We are not to use vain repetition, it says, as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard of their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of. Uh, back in 1 Kings 18, when Elisha is confronting the prophets of Baal, you know, they get, he challenges them, to ser, challenges the people to either serve God or serve Baal. And so he challenges the prophets of Baal to, to a contest. And, of course, he allows the prophets of Baal to go first, and they get up and they start praying and chanting. And hours later of praying and chanting, their God, their false God, Baal, has not responded to them. But, but Elijah... Elijah, he gets up. It, it, it says here the prophets of Baal prayed from morning even until noon. That's at least three hours and absolutely nothing. No response whatsoever. Elijah gets up. He, he builds a separate altar unto the Lord. And then he prays 63 words took less than three minutes. And God responded in the form of fire coming down and consuming the sacrifice. It's not the length of the prayer that determines the heart attitude. You look at Elijah, only 63 words, and yet you saw God move. You saw God respond. And yet those prophets of Baal prayed for over three hours and nothing. It is important for us to understand <coughs> that it, it, is, it is coming from the heart. And it's also important to understand that you have to be a child of God to pray to God as your father. Now, the illustration, verses 9 through 13, the illustration, verses 9 through 13, of the right way to pray, the right way to pray. And this is often referred to as the Lord's Prayer. It is probably more accurately de described as the disciples' prayer because Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray. <coughs> Verse 9 says this, After this manner, therefore, ye pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
this is the model prayer. Notice in this model prayer, Jesus says, first you need to address our Father. So notice, notice here, he addresses God. Our Father indicates that he, you already have a relationship with God, the Father. You're already addressing him as your father. So you already have that relationship with him. And notice that it begins with the focus on heaven. So often our prayers begin with our focus on ourselves. No, God wants us to focus on him. That Our, our prayer should begin in heaven and then move to earth. Our focus should, first and foremost... Be on God. Notice what he says. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Uh, notice the devotion to God. Notice the concern for God's glory and honor. Hallowed means to, to make something holy, right? Uh, hallowed be the, addresses the attention of the prayer towards God. Reverence for his name and for his person. Hallowed be thy name. So often, so often in in, in media and on TV, God's name is used as a swear word. But it's not, God's name is to be holy because it, 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 God's name reflects who he is. And God is holy. So most of you are aware of the formula that, that oftentimes uh, we, we use to guide people in learning how to pray. And that, that, that formula is, is ACTS, A-C-T-S, which stands for adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. That is, that is a formula that a lot of people use uh, in, in praying so that they can kind of stay on track. But notice how that begins as well, with adoration, with hallowed be thy name. Now notice verse 10, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. <coughs> they're expressing their desire to see the Lord glorified on, on earth. The disciples needed to, and then after that, notice here in verse 11, give us this day our daily bread. Now, they weren't just talking about bread in the sense of bread that we eat, okay? That is just, that is, uh, they're talking about food, they're talking about clothing, they're talking about shelter. But notice that they are saying, give us this day our daily bread. They're just looking for God's to meet their needs that day. They're not looking for five years from now, from ten years from now. They're, they're praying for God to meet their needs that day. Now, it next goes on in the model prayer, or the Lord's Prayer, to say, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now, it is not that he needed to forgive others in order to earn the forgiveness of God. Rather, this willingness to forgive others is evidence of the transformation that God's forgiveness had brought into the disciples' life. We don't forgive that... We, in, in, in other words, this forgiveness they're talking about it <coughs> isn't for, for salvation, but for fellowship. For fellowship. In, other, in order for us to be in proper fellowship with our Heavenly Father, we need to be willing to forgive others. If our, if our uh, horizontal relationship with others is not right, it will affect our vertical relationship with our Holy Father. And if our relationship or our fellowship with our Heavenly Father is not right, then it will re uh, affect our horizontal relationship with others. How can we be unforgiving to others when God has forgiven us for so much? You see, that is what we need to remember. We must be willing to forgive others because God has done so much to forgive us. It is amazing to me. Do you realize... Christians, that it was our sin that Jesus paid the price for. It was our sin 
that caused Jesus to leave the glory of heaven, to come to this earth, to live on this earth, this sin-cursed earth, to be rebuked by people, to be beaten by people, to be to have to wear a crown of thorns on his head for nothing that he did wrong, but just so he could pay the penalty for our sins. And he did that because he loved us, so that we may have forgiveness of our sins. And if he was willing to pay such a great cost for every sin that has ever been committed and ever will be committed, how can we not be willing to forgive others for their sins against us? We, we, we should never forget the cost that was paid for our forgiveness. And, it's, and, it's so, and it says here, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We have been forgiven so much we should be willing to forgive others <coughs> for what they do to us. Notice here, uh, verse 13, And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, or from the evil one. Now, what is interesting is that in Luke chapter 22, verse number 31, it says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Isn't it interesting that Jesus intercedes for us even today, even after salvation in our daily lives, he intercedes for us, but for His grace today, we would be destroyed. But for His prayers for us today, we would be destroyed. The Bible says, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, seeketh about whom he may devour. Satan is always attacking us. Attempting to defeat us, attempting to cause us to stumble, to fall, to fail. And but for the intercession of our mediator in heaven, Jesus Christ, we would fail every day. So it, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. It is <coughs> uh, a plea for help of God in our daily confrontation with the temptation to sin. Um, God does not tempt us to do evil, but we are tempted of our own lust, as it says in James. God does test us in order to give us the opportunity to prove our faithfulness to Him. And then it closes the, the uh, imperative here in verses 14 and 15. The imperative in verses 14 and 15 says this, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And again, this is a reference to the fellowship between a believer and God, not salvation. It is a reference to the fellowship. We want to stay on short accounts with God. We want to keep that fellowship strong. Now, once we are saved, that relationship may, will never be broken. It's important that you understand that. They're not talking about salvation here. They're talking about fellowship. I have three sons. They will always be my sons. There is nothing they can do to change that. They may get mad at me and change their last name. Legally, they could do that. They may get mad at me and never come see me again. They can do that. But biologically, they will always be my children. And believer, it is important for you to understand, once you become a child of God, you will always be a child of God. Now, I may get out of fellowship with my children from time to time. They may do things that disappoint me. 
they may not want to spend time with me. That fellowship may be broken. But that relationship will never be broken. Please, please, I hope, if you get nothing else from today's lesson, I hope you understand that. Now let's look at a discipline that is probably the least practiced among Christians here in America, and that's fasting. That's fasting. Verse 16, Moreover, when ye fast, be not as the hypocrites or pretenders of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. There's that formula again. Uh, when they are fasting for people's praise, they have their reward. It's an earthly reward. Notice verse 17, but thou, but you believer, but you Christian, when you fast, when thou fastest, anoint thy head and wash thy face, that thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Just as when you pray, you are to go into your inner room, into your closet, and pray secretly, and God will, will reward you openly. So when we fast as believers, we are to fast secretly, and God will reward us openly. In that day, the Jews, when they fasted, they would, they would, their appearance would be, um, would be wrong. They would, they would attempt to look like they were fasting. They, their facial expressions would be sad so that they were fasting, so that people would, would understand they were fasting. Their clothes would be unkempt, would not be, would not be sharp. Okay, they would, they would look like they had just rolled out of bed. They, their appearance would not be uh, good because they wanted to appear to people to be fasting so that they would, people would look at them as being pious. It, is, it says here that in Jesus' day, Mondays and Thursdays were most commonly set aside for fasting. To make their fasting evident, some individuals would have tried to appear sad. Human praise would be their reward. But Jesus said, in contrast, Jesus instructed the people to have a happy appearance while fasting. They were to evidence joy and prosperity by taking the customary care to give a normal appearance. Only God would know that the person would fasting. The fasting would then be a gift to God, who would later reward the fasting person. That's the right way in verses 17 and 18. Don't put on a show. Don't put on a show for others that you're fasting. God says, make your appearance normal. Make your appearance look like everybody, like, like it's a typical day. And if you fast secretly, you will be rewarded openly by God. So why do we need to fast? Well, there's many reasons. One, fasting is used most often, I think, to determine God's will in a specific situation. I know when, when, when I was praying about coming on full-time here at Bible Baptist Church as an associate pastor, I fasted because I wanted to determine if it was God's will for me to accept the job, to come on here full time. Um, it, it, is a, it is a serious step that you as an individual take to help understand God's will for your life. And it is not, it, it is not something to be done flippantly. It is to be done seriously. I... Um, I know it is a forgotten discipline in most Christian circles, but I think it is one that we need to implement more and more. And I think we're going to need to implement it more and more as um, we see our country drifting further and further away from God. We see Christians coming under more persecution. I think it's going to require us 
too fast and too to pray, to discern God's will for our life. We've had it easy for the most part as believers uh, here in America, but that is changing. So as we look uh, back over this lesson, it's important as Jesus addresses three specific areas in a believer's life where he needs to make he or she needs to make sure that their motivation and their attitude is right in the area of alms. Uh, there is the right, there's the wrong way of giving to others, and that is to have the praise of men. And there is the right way of giving to others, and that is to do so secretly. Um, in prayer, uh, there is the wrong way of praying, that is ostentatious. You know, it, 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 it just me personally, when, when someone is praying publicly and they start going, into eschatology and numerology and, and transubstantiation, and they start bringing out, breaking out these big words in their prayers. I, I, I struggle with that a little bit as to where their heart is. Now, obviously, I can't see their heart. I can't know. I can't judge. But just because they know they pray these big words in their prayers is no evidence that they're close to the Lord. There is a right attitude. There is a wrong attitude to have in prayer. And we need to uh, have the right attitude. Uh, in addition, of course, we talked about the, just recently about the wrong way and the right way to fast. And I hope that in these three areas, we see that God is looking on the, on the heart. <coughs> in 1 Samuel, it says, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And I hope we understand why it is important to have the right motivation. One, to glorify God, as I mentioned earlier. Two, to be an example to the unsaved, to win the lost. And three, because one day, each of us, We'll get, stand before God. If we know Christ is our Savior, we will stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for everything we have done in this body since we have accepted Christ as our Savior. And I hope that you, like, like I and like most Christians, we want to hear those words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thank you for allowing me to teach this lesson today. And I look forward to when we will be able to gather together back at this church uh, and uh, worship and have Sunday school. Thank you. God bless. Mm -hmm.